Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I can see that the people is joining and we will wait some seconds because the number of attendees is very fast increasing. As so well, it's three o'clock in Barcelona, in Spain, in Europe, and uh, and we can wait a couple of minutes, yeah, one minute to some phone calls. Yeah, I can see now. Ahead. Okay. Uh, It's, it's 3.01 and it's time to start the, week, the big weekly webinar of the series of Eat Dust uh, talks that are basically focusing in, in the are, are the art webinars related with the dust topic. And uh, today we have the topic of on visualization uh, oriented to user products. And before to the introduction, to our speaker, I would like to explain a little bit how it's working the webinar in this interface. As you may know, you are muted all the time, but you can listen and follow all the discussions. Also, you have uh, you have to know that the webinar is recorded and it will be available at the end of the some days after the event because we have, we need some couple of days for for uploading in the Indash website. It will be accessible through the Indash website. And things that you have to be aware for interact with us during the webinar is that you have two specific uh, boxes. Any one is the chat box. When you want to talk with us, you can you can uh, communicate with us through the chat if you want. But also you have the questions box, and you should use this question box uh, for writing your questions for the speaker. And you can do it along the webinar. It's not needed that you wait until the end. You can start writing whenever you want. And Estelius and myself, we will share the questions and we will translate the questions to the speaker of today. Then don't hesitate to, to use it. And uh, I hope that you will interact a lot during the talk. Then I will invite you to don't hesitate to write any question or comment in, the, in this question box. And with it, I think that Estelius is your turn. Okay, so today uh, Dr. Isadora Jimenez is going to talk, to, uh, talk about data visualization in user-tailored products. Uh, Dr. Jimenez is the head of the knowledge transfer team in the Earth Sciences Department of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. She leads a transdisciplinary team of 12 people that includes social scientists, science communication specialists, an economist, and UX expert and research engineers. Uh, this team works closely with the air system scientists, both in climate and atmospheric composition, to ensure that the scientific advances bring value to society and to facilitate the services. So currently, uh, Dr. Jimenez he is also in the science communication, is the science communication manager of the Cost Action Indust, and she was going to speak for about 30 minutes uh, or a little bit more. Uh, Isadora, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for for allowing me to this time to speak and and talk about a topic that I I really love, and I hope to to pass some of uh, what I love from this field to all of you. Um, so well, first a bit of a background. I mean, because I work in a team, this is uh, the joint knowledge and efforts from many people working in the team. So I acknowledge all of them. You, of course, I work on, on dust products and also on air quality products, but most of my expertise in the last years comes from climate. So you will see that I use quite often uh, climate related examples and products, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's the same either for one topic or the other. The, the knowledge behind works exactly the same. So let's go ahead. And I'm going to start with an example from, from climate change. And 
one of the things that I mean, most of us we are probably aware is that uh, climate scientists have been uh, warning about climate change uh, for decades now, and there is this common understanding thinking that what's happening, why it is not working, why people is not getting the message or is not acting upon the message in all th of time ahead. And one of the things is that we, and I include myself because I'm also a scientist, uh, we think that if we provide the data, if we provide in the most clear, neutral way, then we are going to tr trigger uh, action from, from the people who really need to act. But the point is, that it is not about the data, it is not about what we communicate, it's also about how do we communicate. And this is where my job starts. I'm a scientist, but I just moved to science communication because I really saw that this was a gap on, on the scientific community that I really wanted to, to work in. And when we think about how do we communicate, for example, about climate change or any topic, there are two main aspects that we have to take into account. First is always, that we have to take into account narratives. Uh, we can call it narratives or storylines, uh, storytelling. The point is, no matter what we communicate, even if it's data, even if it's uh, quite of a technical information, we need to understand which is the narrative behind. An example of this in climate is Greta Thunberg. And one of the key parts of the success of, of Greta Thunberg and, and being now a, a worldwide uh, climate influencer is because there is a very powerful narrative behind. So three years ago, Greta Thunberg, uh, a girl 15 years old, just she decided to do something against climate change. And it was a striking one day per week for it. And it's something so simple as bringing the narrative that no matter how small you are, you have something to do against climate change. And no matter if you're not gonna change the policies, at least you can do something. That's a narrative. That's an example of a narrative that, at the end, it has become a major uh, success. But besides the part of narratives, of course, there's the part of visuals, and I guess that's why you got into the into the webinar. And visuals are equally important as narratives. They have to go together. And when we talk about visuals, it's just everything that gets into your imagination and into into your visual aspects, because mainly. It's what makes an impact in your memory. And we have seen many, many types of charts talking about climate change, all IPCC reports. But then if you focus, for example, in the Show Your Stripes by Ed Hopkins, you see that something simple that conveys almost the same message that thousands of charts that we have seen before suddenly has become uh, something that people use as a, something in, in their Twitter profiles is something that defines themselves. It's just because it's a visualization that is beautiful, is simple, and it conveys a very clear message. So visuals and narratives are key for this. And you may think that this is just something for, for outreach, for broad audiences, but the truth is that this is, this is real for any type of user. So no matter if we are talking about policymakers, if we are talking about people in, in industry, civil protection, any type of user, any person in the world is susceptible to narratives and visuals. So that's why we talk about user tailored products and because we really want to give a type of information that we think that is relevant for a particular uh, user and we'll have to provide it in a way that it makes an impact on them. Then we can have different purposes for creating a user tailored product. So from raise awareness or just engagement to ensure that a particular group of, of people really start a conversation with the scientific community that knows about something. But it's also about transferring the knowledge or even to helping and supporting the decision making based on the latest advances of, of research. No matter which is the purpose, at the end, the objective of any visualization or any user tailored product is to trigger some action. And for doing this, um, I'm gonna start with this slide and finish with this slide. What we need is a transdisciplinary approach. A common mistake that we do on, on science at the very beginning probably is that we think that we have something that is very relevant and that that's all we need is just to put this information in the hands of someone, and then there's going to be something happening. The truth is that we need to understand 
we need to know who are those users, we, who is that community, what they are doing, which has the, their capacity of making decisions. If we are targeting a particular set of policymakers, is them the ones changing the policy or do we have to provide this information to someone else? And for doing this, we need uh, social sciences. And if you have been tracking European funding, in age 2020, there was science with and for society. And this call was about <clears throat> specifically social and communication. Now this is embedded in any research uh, call in, in Horizon Europe. So it is important. Whenever you have to talk about creating a user-tailored product, then you need to un un acknowledge that it's not just scientists that are needed. We need social scientists, we need people, experts in communication, uh, data architects, we need designers, uh, people on economy, so we need a lot of profiles. So this is a preamble, but I think I thought it was really important. And what I want to do in, in the webinar today is to give you some glimpses of all the aspects that go beside the visualization of a user tailor product. All these aspects, each of them, I mean, I don't know if we will reach the eight of them, they need the specialized profiles to be working together with the scientists in order to, to get the maximum potential. I'm not gonna teach you about each of them, but I want just you to have a bit of an idea of what happens with all of them. And the first one is usually underestimated, it's design. So the point is, design is not just about something beautiful, design is something that is all around, and mainly we only realize when it fails. And these are some examples, but we all know about applications and websites where we go inside and we get annoyed because it's very difficult to find the information or it's not working the way we expect it. That's a, a fail on design. But it's also about aesthetics. And sometimes as scientists, we focus so much in, in the soundness of the, of the data and the information, then we forget that aesthetics also matter and that the wow factor can really open the, the doors to many of our products, to the right people. And we all have unconscious biases. One is that scientists sometimes think if you spend time in putting something beautiful, you are not spending the time in making it properly. But we also, as human beings, we are also susceptible to beautiful things. So that's why many people have uh, Apple. So Apple is, has good design, it has functionality, and we have more sets. So even if we are scientists, we are susceptible to beautiful things. And I wanted just to share an example. And this case is about the impacts of mineral dust. This is a typical slide that we can show. It has all the information, all relevant information is there. And this is a leaflet that was created in Indust. The information behind it is the same. I mean, we have aviation, we have ground transportation, energy, agriculture. But the difference of having a designer working together with the scientists makes a difference. And the surprise is this is not just only useful for people who doesn't, who is new to the topic, but this is even useful for the scientists because then you can use it in your presentations. That we, that we are scientists doesn't mean that we don't like to have nice pictures and nice images and visuals in, in our presentations. So this is an example how design can really help improve uh, pushing forward our messages. This is another example. Uh, that uh, I was working some years ago. It is still working, although now it's not the hurricane season, so you will you will not see working. And in this case, we really wanted to reach this wow factor. And that's why we were working with a designer, finding the most beautiful way to put the information, which uh, the information in the case of seasonal hurricane prediction, it was just the number of expected hurricanes for a particular season coming from all the different forecasters that are right now online, coming from private sector or research institutions and, and other organizations. And when we were launching this, we, we had some, some people telling us, okay, but this is just an aggregator. You're just providing, providing a mean, a number, and which is the use of this? Okay, so sometimes the product is as simple as providing easy access to information, and sometimes even the product is providing a well-designed page, something that is not a, sorry, a pain in the ass for, for the user. And we find out that, for example, many journalists just go to the page because in just one graphic that is nice and attractive, they can get the information of all the other forecasters. 
and the forecasters in this website they are happy because they still have their websites but they also have visibility then in a, in a web page that really gets to a broader audience so just that i mean just don't disregard the sign it's something important it's something that usually we get at the end and it's difficult to allocate money to it but it usually makes the last step the difference in the last step of of given visibility to a user tailored uh, product. The other thing that is key and is not even yet getting to the data visualization itself is about how you created that this data visualization. And for that it's very important to you have a user centric design. Assuming that we know a particular type of user, we know that there is a particular type of scientific or technical data that is going to be useful for them. Even in that situation, once you know that, it's never as easy as uh, creating two, two charts. Sometimes it works, but at the end, if you want to do a product, something that is operational or gets uh, bigger, then you need to go through this uh, approach where you really need to understand which is the user experience of that product. And there are many types. This is a, a whole field in itself and something that can can be using different methodologies depending on what you want to do. So this is just a glimpse of what it comes in this user centric approach. But on one side, for example, something basic is having interviews with those users that you have uh, that you have happened to to learn that they really want to have a product and understanding with their own words what they expect from that product, what they want to be, which are their pain points, where do they have problems to get an information that is relevant for them that you want to provide them or which are the points of interest they have so we have these questions in the interviews and then we try to make these affinity maps where we get the insights from the interviews into into the big points that we need to address with the user tailored product then something that you usually escape if we don't have a ux researcher in the team is to define who is the user profile this is usually called personas and it's just a general image of a person that doesn't exist, but somehow summarizes a group of users that they are going to be interacting with your, with your platform. And once you make these profiles, you may have one, two or three, then you start defining which is the user journey. Why should they get to your product? What do they want to do? Which is the decision that they want to make? How do they want, what do they want? Do they want data, uh, just a chart? a summary, they want to spend only one minute in your platform or they want to play around with a lot of options. All this is what is defining a user journey. And once you know all of this, there's still a lot of work to do. I mean, all this is about talking with users and with the scientists that really have an idea of what the users might want. But then you have to go to co-creation workshops. And co-creation is a word that is right now everywhere and we need to be aware is it's not just about users, it's not just about scientists, it's really about putting together all the knowledge. And this is an example of a product that is being created about dust and which information should be where, where do we want to have the control, which variables, and all this has to be done and rounds and, and slowly. So these co-creation workshops are really important. And for sure, no matter in which point of the process, you need to have a constant feedback from users and from the technical team. And this type of testing can have a lot of methodologies depending on what you want to do, but then there are a tracking tests where people is looking in the screen when you put in front of them a, a chart or, or a product. Some guerrilla testing, bipolar laddering methods, and having just meetings, uh, people explaining to you what they think about what you are developing, etc. This may seem a lot of um, a lot of things that have to do, but all of this is just about understanding how to make a, a product that is demand driving, that it's going to meet really the needs of the user. But once you know all of this, you still have to actually implement it. And if you want to implement a good or successful or useful user tailored product, you still have more steps that have to be done. So on one side, you have to think about the information architecture of, of your product. 
And here it comes more when we are talking not just about a figure or a chart, we are thinking more about an online platform, which more or less is the is the future is where we are going with the product we live online so we are used to have apps or online applications where we can find information so more and more often no matter which is the service or the product that you are creating is going to be embedded in a website and you need to know which is the information architecture uh, that holds all this information so no matter the user they really know where they can find the information they are looking for once you know all this information architecture you have to start designing the structure of this website in what it is called a low fidelity prototype which is just the scheme of what it works or not where it should be each information then you have to work on branding guides so it's we come back to the design so you have to decide on colors styles and which is the message that you want to convey with with that uh, platform or that product online you want to look serious, you want to look uh, something fresh. You Are you addressing uh, young population? Are you addressing policymakers? This, all this needs to be taken into account for the branding guide. Finally, you still have all the high fidelity prototype where you put this design together with the low fidelity and then you have something that looks like the final product. Still, all this is about designing. I'm not going to enter into all the implementation because in all this process, and that's why we talk about co-production or co-creation, it's not just what the users want, it's not just about which are the results that, um, that can be brought by the scientific team, but it's also what is feasible technically. And we just need to understand this is a complex process and this is almost the standard for any good private sector product and for sure for any online product and it is like that because it's the way that you get something that is really useful and people would like to pay and for scientists it should be the same if people if you want people to be using a product then you really need to be sure that the product is for them this is all about how you create it but then okay we get to the point where which is the core of the product so how am we going to um, to communicate visually the information the scientific information the technical knowledge that we have and for this the key concept is visual encoding so we have to think about which is the type of data and the type of product that we want to create so we want to show <clears throat> a comparison a relationship uh, are we going to be showing maps so we need to understand with all that previous part what the user wants to find and then we have to start working in that particular types of charts this is an example of a of a contract that i'm coordinating it is a climate service it's a product about climate change for journalists so what a policymaker may want to know about climate change maybe in a time series is not the same as journalists journalists for example for them it's quite important to make ranking this is the uh, hottest summer in the last 20 years so you need to do all that research in order to know that you need a type of product that is a ranking because that's what is going to be relevant for them that's why user-centric approach comes into place because it tells you exactly the type of product that you have to develop you know which type of product and let's say that it is a map or a chart but then you have to make further decisions about the visual encoding of the information so you need to decide uh, if you are going to be showing the information like an average value with uh, some interval of confidence if you're going to be showing the information encoded through the slope imagine we were talking about wind so if we want to show the direction of wind probably we will want to encode the information visually as a um, as with tilt or with angle we might also decide to use different color hues in this case for example if we want to make a, a risk or a warning system then we, we might want to use different colors and use different hues or we want to use transparency there's a whole field about visual encoding which are the best options to be used and sometimes as scientists we are just so busy in our part that we forget that there are cool disciplines and fields that they have been for decades working on what works best for what and 
because it's better to talk about uh, our own failures. This is an example of one of the first projects I was involved that were, had a strong visual aspects. And we were creating uh, a service that was providing information about wind, wind forecasts. The point is we had a very good visual data visualization expert. And at the end, we used angle, we used uh, transparency, and we used also different types of color. When we were testing this with users, we found out that we were doing an error. It was a failure on design because transparency, transparency uh, was affecting the perception of color. So mainly the users could only see only see the big spots, but they could not read a particular number or proportion in, in the map. So this is something that we have to learn. And at that time, every, if we had looked into, the, into bibliography, if we had been more sensitive to previous disciplines, we would have known that this was a, a major mistake in our tool. Quite successful in reaching emotionally to the users. It was in the media, in the Guardian, everywhere, but not successful for the user that actually had to read information in it. And also when visual encoding information for a product, there is a current, a very common mistake by scientists is that we try to put as much information as possible in just a single figure. This is something that happens because we are used to have a very limited number of figures to put in a paper. It's just because we target a, a, an audience, other scientists that are very picky, they, they want to have as much information as possible. But this is because we are creating a product, a figure that is for another scientist, and we do it pretty well. The point is, if we want to go to another type of audience, putting a lot of information in the same figure is not necessarily the right way of going. So less is usually better. Then once you decide which is, how are you going to be showing uh, your information, if you're gonna be showing just a map with different colors, whatever, um, then you really need to pay a special attention about color. And it's a type of visual encoding, but in itself, it's so important that we really need to pay a lot of attention for it. And first and most important thing is we have to understand that not all color scales are right. And first, please, I mean, if you are involved in a team building a product, use colorblind friendly uh, colors because there's a 10% of population, 10% of male population in the world who cannot read well uh, a particular combination of colors. And maybe you have seen it uh, before, you have heard it before, but I mean, I live day to day with uh, situations where I have to remind people that this is not colorblind friendly. This is the case of precipitation. It has been used for so long that people is so used, precipitation is quite often shown with this color scale. But if you see in a simulation for colorblind people, you see that exceptionally above precipitation and much below precipitation, is almost not possible to, to differentiate in the map. <coughs> so we have to be aware. And the common answer by a scientist that is not sensitive to this topic is, okay, but you know, this is the usual way that we do it. And we have always been doing like that. But then, okay, if we are building new products and now we know that this is not fine, then we need to find alternative ways of doing. So I, I really, uh, invite you to consider this the next time that you have to do a product. This is particularly important if we are creating risk maps and because we are quite uh, used to the standard of using the, the fire light, you know, red, green, yellow for, for talking about risk. But the point is, although in this case it's not dramatic, it is not working well. So you have this type of color and this one is very hard to differentiate. And so we have to move a bit away of this. And I tell you from experience, because for these seasonal hurricane predictions, we knew that the colors that we were using were not fine. There was a scientific decision that we wanted to stick to yellow, green, and red, because that was what people was used to. And at the end, we got a lot of complaints because of course, there's a 10% of population that was not reading it well. At the end, we changed. 
Now we have still a warning system with red, orange, yellow. It works well. There's no problem with colorblind people. And it is still this warning sense. So we can have alternatives. And the key message is, OK, normal practice does not mean that it's good practice. And as long as we know and we realize, we really need to start working on, on changing our practices. Then the other part of color is that we need to mine human perception. And one of these things is the rainbow color scale. Uh, I don't know if you have, I mean, I'm sure you have used it because most, most uh, softwares like R, Python, whatever, they have color scales, the rainbow color scale as a default. It's highly attractive. It calls a lot of attention, but it is not a good uh, color scale because different colors have different levels of brightness. So they call more attention than the other while we are showing um, a variable that is really being uh, changing continuously. So there's really, it's not that we cannot use it at all, but we have to use it uh, very carefully and mainly probably not as a continuous color scale, but just putting real meaning in each of the color breaks. So a meaning for blue, for light blue, for green, for yellow, orange, and, and red. So a discrete color scales rather than a continuum. And I know it looks beautiful, but it is not the proper way of working because it can uh, provide effects that and, and false interpretations of the data that is not really what it is showing the data, the real data behind. If you want to learn more, for sure, you can you can look in the internet, you look for end of the rainbow and and yeah, you will find a lot of information and alternative scales that can be used that are safe. And finally, to finish with colors, it, it's also important to understand the semantics of color. And when semantics of colors may might sound strange, but you will probably understand here. If we are talking about the Iraq's bloody toll then red makes sense. This is the semantics of, of colors. Colors, they convey a message behind that comes on our society and, and our understanding. If we think on the most obvious variables like temperature, precipitation, it's the same. We need to understand if we talk about temperature, we cannot put reds below. I mean, we have red above and blue below. These, for example, are probabilities of temperature being above the average. In this tool that I will sh uh, show you later in another example, when we have to show precipitation, for sure we had to switch the color scale. So blue had to be above the average precipitation. A lot of rain is obviously blue, not red. But there are also other small things that we have to take into account. And one of them is that if you use exactly the same colors for temperature and precipitation, the user might not realize that you have change of variables. So might be reading a precipitation map as if they were reading a temperature map, for example. Or if someone makes a screen capture, then they don't have the background information about the variable, so they could be messing around with the product. And that's why a good practice is also if you have two different variables that they behave in, in the opposite ways, it's not just changing accordingly the, the order of the colors, but also maybe changing slightly the color scale. So it is very clear when you are talking about a particular type of variable that has the blue above and about a variable like temperature or wind that has the red above. When we go about all of these, we know about the color, the visual encoding. This we can find a lot of information just on the side of data visualization, and we can try to engage with data visualization experts, but then it gets to a very difficult part, which is about the communication of uncertainty. And this is something highly specific. It's a challenge for science and for any product that we want to communicate, but also it's a problem in data visualization. So it is normal that it's a big challenge. And if we think, for example, on first order uncertainty, so it's really the uncertainty that you want to communicate, uh, like, for example, when you want to communicate probabilities, then there are many different types of solutions. And 
I cannot go inside here, but I just wanted to give you uh, some, some ideas. Like you can go from simple, average, and a possible range. You can be showing anomalies. You can be showing extremes, so not just probabilities, but probabilities of percentiles or extreme percentiles. You can show in terciles, or you can go for, for showing the whole probability distribution function, like uh, if in, in case of climate is quite typical, or in scenarios. All these are examples of climate, but this shows you the range of decisions. And here there is no golden rule because the, finally this is the, the part in, in the creation of a user-tailored product that is challenging, is understanding what the user needs to make a decision, what makes sense on the scientific part in order to be, to be safe and sound. But besides that, there is a second order uncertainty, which is about the quality, the skill, or the reliability of the information that we are providing. In this case, because I'm, I'm using examples from climate, it's very clear we come from climate models and there is uh, an inner problem on, on the quality or the predictability capacity of, of the models. But if we talk about observations, there's still the reliability on the actual observations themselves, on the on which are the, um, the technical stuff that is used to make measurements, etc. Again, in this case, I cannot go deeper into it, but uh, there are different ways. If you want to address a, a type of user, a user community that is just starting to interact with a particular topic, maybe you even decide not to show uncertainty. And this is exactly as good an option as showing all the range of uncertainty, because it depends on what is the purpose of your product and what the user that you have at the other side needs in order to understand what you are providing. Then there are options like showing a whole range or a confidence interval. Then if we're talking about maps, there is the option of masking the areas with high uncertainty. So in the case that we are talking about a product for making a decision, you ensure that no one is going to use not reliable information to make a decision. We can use transparency, but again, what I was explaining to you before, we have to be careful because transparency interacts with other visual aspects of the of the product, so we might not uh, enhance or we might hide hidden some data from the product, but it's an option. We might decide to replace, in the case of a prediction, so if my product is not good at this, but there is an alternative product that is it's also better than this in this situation, you may choose to just show the best product available for the particular conditions that are being searched, or you can use interactive options. Okay, so it's allowing the user, empowering the user to decide how much do they want to see? They want to see a forecast, for example, even if it's not the best one, or they want to be very picky, so they only see information that they are know that they can trust 100%. This last part I was explaining, <clears throat> it goes uh, together with the next point, which is the interaction with the information. And Assuming that we have done the visual encoding, choose the right color, we have solved somehow for our product how to deal with uncertainty, still there is a part about how we put this information in an application. And this it's quite related to the user-centric user design, but it's just something specific that I think it's worth explaining. And for this interaction and this interactivity with products, there are two key concepts. One is the progressive disclosure of information. And I'm going to uh, be bold <clears throat> and I'm going to try, try to go live to, to this tool. So just give me one second. <clears throat> this tool, <coughs> you can access yourself and create yourself a, a user and you could ac access. When we talk about progressive disclosure of information, it's about giving the user different layers of complexity. So allowing them to start from simple and then going to more and more complex at their pace. So not bombing them with the most complex information at the beginning, but just doing it slowly. In this case, for example, what you see is that depending on the color, you have, uh, you can see that uh, here the, uh, sorry, temperature is going to be expected to be above the average. 
and in blue places where temperatures are expected to be below the average. This is just simple reading. The color tells me information and I see here what it means. Then we have a second layer of information. Okay, but we have big blue dots and smaller blue dots. So when I go inside these, then I see, okay, I can have blue dots where they tell me that there is more than 50% probabilities of being below the average. So this is a second layer of understanding. Then this is just the beginning, but then you click and then because you already kind of understand what you're reading and you want to know more, and then you get a lateral panel. This is second step. Okay, you had first reading, you could just leave the application, but you don't, you keep, you want to know more. In this case, so you have a bit more information. You, don't, you do not only know uh, that is below the average, but you get the actual number. You get this 53% probabilities of being temperatures below the average. Then you get additional information like skills, for example, or information about extremes, or you even get the full distribution function. So you're getting more information. But then if you're an advanced user, you think you understand this, but you still do want to know more, then you can click again and get even more information. So you get basic information, but then you get evolution over time, or you get to know which is climatology, like the normal condition for that region, or you can even browse past forecasts. This is just an example, it's just a tool, is the one I know, but the concept is that you allow the users, no matter how experts they are, to dive slowly into it. And I can tell you from my own experience, first it sends a lot of information, everyone complains, complains but then advanced users, they get to this and they want more. So it's just understanding the user you, you are addressing. And it's, I'm almost finishing, but this is important also. So this part of interactivity, there's also not just the progressive disclosure of information, but also thinking on an interactive design. And if I go back to, to the application, interactivity is about empowering the user. So for sure, a climate service can be this. It's a PDF that it's providing, it's based on this tool, but it's providing a PDF with the outlook for a particular month, telling people what do they expect. This is a product, and this is a user-tailored product that has been successful in, in, in their operations. But if you can allow the user to choose the forecast that they want, if you allow them to decide with a slider the quality, the quality of what they are seeing, if you allow them to pick up, be more picky on, on the probability. So for example, see places with probability of having temperatures above the average is above 80% or showing extremes. All this is about making an application interactive. And this is something that we can do now because we have the tools that we have. And the, finally, this makes a change for the users because it empowers them. It's not the scientist or the developer of the product that makes the decision, but it's really them that decide the thresholds that they want to see and upon when they want to make a decision. And I'm going to finish because I know it has been quite a few minutes, but just these two aspects that are quite related is that even when you think that you have all your visual stuff defined, when you have done all the good work with a lot of different experts interacting with the scientific team, you still have to deal with a lot of things that have to do with the text within the product. And this is the part that we never realize when we talk about user-tailored products. It's not just about getting the right chart or the right figure. It's about all the, we call it copy, but it's like all the small labels and text that they are in, in these products. So this is one product about dust or the prototype for a dust product how you name variables, how you put all the information, which is the, which is the format of the coordinates. Are you going to put one, one decimal, two? Are you going to put north or not? Everything, all the text that appears in a, in a product needs to be thought, discussed, 
and not just by scientists, but also by science communication experts, by the people that has been interacting with the users. This is an example from this product for journalists. Then what you provide in text for a journalist in the selectors is quite different to what we do for a very scientific uh, um, profile. Then I'm not going to get more into it, but also there's a lot of text that is just about how to guide the user. So when you hover the mouse over an application, this is small help that it appears, the tool tips, guided tours, FAQs, advanced documentation, or even, even further background context and information about your product. All this is relevant and it has to go together with your user tailored product. And finally, and I close, no matter what we do, if we are doing a regional product, we are usually we are using the local language, but quite often when we are doing an international product, we usually work in English, particularly for European projects or products developed at European level. And we have to understand that this is a non-inclusive practice and some of the products that we are creating are relevant for everyone. So yeah, we really need to be aware of this and, and find uh, ways of solving, usually by having enough money to, to get to the challenge of getting a product multilingual. All of this, always thank you and thanks for having a lot of very different profiles working together. Scientists alone, we are not super, we don't have superpowers. So we really need to, to team with experts in all, the, all these fields in order to have a successful product. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sadora. Thank you very much for your Thank very you interesting uh, talk. Uh, yeah, I have, have to some... say, just yeah. I want to say a few words that I don't know if you know that here at Barcelona we have we are managing together the IMF, the Spanish Pent Office the WMO, that regional center. And in the in the presentation of Lisa Dora, there were some spoils, I have to say. Then that's for your info. It will be launched in September. And this year we will have a new website and it will be more user friendly, I promise you. Yes, yes, we're steady. Yes. Uh... So thank you, Sadora. We have some uh, questions. Uh, we don't have too much time, but uh, before starting, just I have one comment that, uh, yes, scientific knowledge and uh, people that know how to transfer this to a very nice environment that everybody understands it, it's very crucial and also but I think everything starts from the fact on what we want to do. If we want to present our scientific results in a very nice way, there are some very nice websites with a very scientific, uh, uh, yeah, very scientific data that, but uh, if we are aiming for the public or a larger audience or, have to understand that uh, some easy, let's say, aspects for the scientific point of view are extremely important for this audience. And we have to address them even if we don't understand how important they are. Uh, so I will, I will read the, the first question from Daphne from Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, that she has actually two questions. The first one, uh, it's a little bit general. It says, is could science communication help research projects address target stakeholders or civil groups in order to communicate their results? If so, what would be the best way in your opinion? Is it a company? Uh, and, uh, I, so the I question is, I, I if in your opinion, a company would uh, do a better job in this aspect? So my opinion is, of course, it's good to have uh, companies or private companies that support with design and that they are specialized on science communication. 
So they are not just good designers, but good designers who care about the details that scientists care. So in this sense, there is room from private sector. But our approach is what I really like most is that we work together with scientists. We are part almost another research group in inside BSC, and we work together because it's it's never as easy as telling someone what you want and do it. You really need someone who has a lot of confidence and and knows how to sit down with the scientists that you know each other. You build trust with with the scientists in in the department. And then you learn about which are the needs, and then you can go to these user tailors. So I think for me, the way forward it could be really either having the the science communication and these transdisciplinary teams embedded inside the research groups, or having a very close interaction and collaboration between institutions that are a bit more specialized in this part of transferring knowledge together with the more technical part. But it is not just one time collaboration. There's another question related to this uh, to this uh, answer. That is, how is the social scientist uh, enrolled in this process? I mean, what is exactly the, the the role of the social science? Let's say. So the role is at the very beginning. I just it's coming from Maria Tasco. <laughs> I I just couldn't go the whole process, but mainly you need to understand who is your user. I mean, I have been focused on, you know, your user, you know, what is their needs, and then you start doing the, the user tailored product. But you need to understand if you're addressing the CEO of a company or the technical climatologist inside a company. And all this requires a lot of, res of research. It requires engagement. It requires doing workshops, doing interviews. So all this is what social scientists know. They know the techniques. They know how to analyze all this information. So that's the, the main role. It's understanding these users. And of course, in all this process that I have explained, social scientists could still be involved. But it's mainly at the very beginning before we start with everything that I have start explaining. Another question that maybe is because there are a couple that are related to studies, but this is a little bit different. It's coming from Mark Barrington, that is from the European Center. And he He's asking uh, uh, if you can comment the importance of providing da data, the data source behind these visualization tools when you are communicating. I mean, it's, it's really important and it comes with all these part that I was talking about text. Um, it is not just text, sometimes it's, it's more than text. So it is very important that you provide the background information. So it's not just which is the product that you are providing, but uh, how trustable this information you are providing is. So in this sense, either knowing from which institution or which is the source of the information is, is key, but also sometimes just providing the actual link to the data. And something that I have not been able to, to highlight here, no matter which is the user, in my experience, at the end, most users, they tell you that, okay, very nice product, visual product, but can you give me now the data? And even journalists that you could expect that they want just the visual nice thing that they can use, it is not. I mean, even journalists, they say very nice visual. Can you give me please the data so I can play with it? So yeah, it is very important to know about the sources, to put it clearly in the product and decide which is the right place, depending on, on the type of audience. Okay. There's a question about the software that you sold. Uh, uh, if it's an open source, I guess the answer is not for this particular example that you sold, but uh, also if it can be used for other uh, applications that like uh, weather prediction models or, for example, predict hurricanes. I will leave you to answer that, but I guess yeah, this was I'm, just an example you saw about. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the example, yeah. I guess they are meaning for this application I was entering. Um, it is the product of a, of a project, European project. So it is open for everyone to browse. And even the code itself, it is not really like protected. What it is going is there is an interest for the energy sector. So there is the idea of uh, getting this as a commercial product 
with the current forecast for energy people. And that's why after three years of free operation and operations and everything, now it, we are not updating, but mainly because of the costs. I mean, as scientists, we would like to keep it open, but it is not feasible, the effort that it takes to keep it open and running and providing this forecast. Anyway, doing or not doing a product in open source is just a decision of the team. It's one of the requirements that you start doing with this initial user-centric approach. You make this decision, you talk with the scientists, with people, the users, with the technical, and you decide is this something that has to be provided to the community open source? If it has to, it's just a matter of finding the right platforms to do it. So it is feasible, it's not a problem. It's just a, a strategic decision when you create one of these products. Okay. Also, the audience is asking, the, can you hear me? Maybe I'm delay. Um, some of the the participants of the webinar is asking if you can give them some software tool to put in practice the, the tips that you show during the talk about colors and the yeah. effect of the different colors in the final product and things like that. Uh, a tool, you, you were saying. So, for example, something very basic, you can oh. download some extensions for your browser. So sometimes, I mean, not all of them are the same level of precise, but uh, sometimes you can play. So you can really open something or a chart that you have and see how it would look like for, for different types of color blindness. So it's something that is very at hand. And then also you can just search a bit around about color blind friendly color scales and you will find out different levels of uh, types of color scales that they are safe and well tested. One, so sometimes it's just searching a bit for the colors. It's just going for what we know that is already working and it's already online. But uh, if you look for specifically in Google, you will find quite straightforward uh, options and solutions. And is there any other platform where the participants can learn more about science communication? Oh. Well, platform, I don't know. There are many trainings. And it's true that there are formal trainings like masters. And in my case, I was a, a, a doctor, I was scientist, and I just wanted to specialize on, on science communication. But there are also crash courses, like uh, four or five days in one place or something online. And I, I don't know now on the top of my head something, but I can just uh, maybe provide a few links to Sarah to be shared uh, somewhere in the in the in the video but look for it i mean there are small opportunities that for just scientists improving a bit more or understanding a bit more about this and then it's about practice what i know about science communication okay some people like me we specialize on this but i also know some of the best science communication people that i that i know they are still scientists practicing so they just love it and the more you do it the more you learn you make mistakes. I have done a lot of mistakes and I have been showing you mistakes that I have been doing. So it's it. I mean, you do it and you learn and you keep improving. That's that's the way. Okay. Uh, there is a message from uh, uh, Maria Tasco that points out that there is a group of uh, uh social science professional in argentina that you to contact and it's in the chat in the questions uh a last question maybe it's what are the socioeconomic sectors you focus on when disseminating information from uh, uh, marco miani from the cyprus institute mm -hmm. It, it depends on the field you work. I mean, for example, in my case, for the years I have been working on this, I have been mainly working with renewable energies, just because a bit of my background on, came from that. We have been working a lot with, with agriculture. Some of the examples that I have been displayed are there. Policymakers, definitely, they are target users, and we need more policy science advice and or science policy advice. and 
it depends in, in the topic that you are specialized. If you are in water management, then maybe you address specifically uh, water planning and and city planners. So I mean, it depends on your specialization. At BSC, it's uh, we touch in climate things mainly agriculture, energy, but then also when we talk about dust related products, then there is aviation for sure. There is health policymakers for sure. It's a key a key actor also. Okay, Sarah, maybe we have to stop because it's four o'clock and we said that it's an hour. Where we start? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we we are keeping our philosophy to be on time always, just to give you an idea that it's one hour and it's one hour. Always you can contact our speakers through email or you can catch stereos of myself and we will share with you all the information related with the contact. And my last and uh, not new is to announce the next webinar in 15 days, remember, Wednesday, 10th March at 3 uh, Central European time. We will have the talk of Nicholas Milton about dust impacts on oceans. And the work that he will present is part of a United Nations report that was uh, published recently. And it is in the registration form. You can get it if you want then I hope that you share with us this hour in two weeks and hoping that you enjoy the webinar. Thanks a lot, Isadora, for the talk. And uh, just keep in touch through the website or the Slack channel or the email, as you wish. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.